how holding companies are the magical solution to all your real estate financing problems. Right, guys? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, no. <laughs> uh, I think what we really want to do with this episode is just set some expectations. You are personally guaranteeing the loan. Yeah. It is the exact same thing as purchasing the property by yourself without a corporation. The corporation ends up being just the shell entity that holds the asset. You still need to personally, personally qualify for the loan with your GDS and TDS ratios on the residential side to qualify for the actual mortgage. What is up YouTube, Matt McKeever here, and you guys love it when I talk corporate to you. So in today's video, we're gonna be talking about holding companies with Josh and Aaron from the Finlay Mortgage Team, and we're gonna be exploring it from the financing perspective. So in the past, you know, I've talked about the accounting aspects of structuring your company, potentially having a holding company or the three tier corporate structure. Uh, we'll throw a link in the video description down below if you guys wanna jump over to that video. But in today's video, we're really gonna be taking a look at the financing aspect, because again, we've had Ryan from Carson Law talk to us about holding companies and buying in a corp from the legal aspects. So let's focus on what does how does this all come together really when you're looking at financing that transaction? A lot of investors have the misconception that this is some sort of silver bullet that's gonna solve all your problems. It's not, but we're gonna explain why a lot of investors still choose to incorporate and have a holding company when it comes to their real estate with Josh and Aaron from the Finlay Mortgage Team. Let's jump into it. What is up YouTube, Matt McKeever here and I've got Josh and Aaron from the Finlay Mortgage Team and today we're going to be talking about how holding companies are the magical solution to all your real estate financing problems. Right guys? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, no. <laughs> uh, I think what we really want to do with this episode is just set some expectations. The biggest thing that I notice with the real estate in investing community being so tight knit is when one investor talks about something it just it spreads like weeds and everybody starts talking about it and everybody thinks that you know that guy got this and that's going to be the same for everybody and it's it's very different when you're purchasing real estate and um you know when you hear one story each individual story is unique to that specific yeah. person in case so just because somebody got a you know sixplex residentially done in a holding company over here with a magical rate does not mean everybody's going to get that and and we, we see that a lot where someone calls and say, hey, I was talking to this guy and he got this done like this and it was this and you know, I wanna get the same thing. And then when we're not able to get it for them, you know, they're, they're disappointed or wondering why they weren't able to get that. And, and every case is very unique and different. So starting with that little bit of a disclaimer there, um, purchasing a hold code does not automatically solve all your problems. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't turn a unqualifiable residential purchase into a qualifiable rental purchase. So there are some things that the investors do need to understand uh, when purchasing properties in a holding company. The first thing a, a lender is going to take a look at is just how long have you owned the, the holding company for. Um, on the residential side, because you're still qualifying personally and using your personal income as their guarantee, they don't really care how long that property has been open for, or that uh, holding company has been open for. Um, they're still going to take a look at your personal income and qualifying. Um, if you do have any other properties in the holding company, it's been around for a while, you know, th you're still going to need to disclose that. Um, they will pull a pin on the numbered company to make sure there aren't any other liabilities in there. So, um, you know, just make sure you disclose that. But length of time doesn't really matter on the residential side. Yeah, important to note, guys, as, as Aaron, just reiterating what Aaron said, you are personally guaranteeing the loan. Yeah. It is the exact same thing as purchasing the property by yourself without a corporation. The corporation ends up being just the shell entity that holds the asset. You still need to personally, personally qualify for the loan with your GDS and TDS ratios on the residential side to qualify for the actual mortgage. Yep, using your income, your liabilities, and the liabilities of that in, in the holding company are still gonna come into play as well too. On the commercial side, it is a little bit different. Um, because we're doing the loan based off of the building and the acquiring uh, company, they are gonna take a look at how long that company has been in operation for. Uh, most lenders are gonna wanna see at least three years of corporate financials if, if possible. Um, some credit unions and some lenders won't even allow the purchase to happen if the, the holding company hasn't been open for, uh, for at least three years. So, you know, being able to determine which lender you're gonna to go to is important because if it's a brand new holding company, you know, they may not allow that at that certain lender. So um, understanding what they're looking for from the lender standpoint uh, is going to be important. Lenders are gonna take a look at that holding company and you know, if there's revenue coming in, what is that year over year revenue? Are you showing 
uh, net operating income? Are you showing a uh, returning to earnings in the company or are you showing a deficit year over year? Um, those are all things that they're going to take a look at. Uh, if you're carrying a deficit year over year, you know, they're going to wonder why. They're going to wonder why. Like, what, what is that loss that you're carrying over? Why is there a deficit? Um, and depending on how close that debt service coverage ratio is on that building, you know, they may need to take a look at the corporate uh, income and the corporate guarantee to help support that cash flow. And if you're underperforming on the building and you have a deficit in your holding company, uh, you know, we're going to have some troubles getting the financing in place. Yeah, I mean, one of the, obviously one of the benefits of having a company is that you can, you know, have shareholder loans, you know, you can borrow money, you can give money. You know, it allows some flexibility with your finances when it comes to your accountant being able to help you with your personal um, taxes. But again, if you are have a $80,000 shareholder loan and you're running a deficit every single year, but your assets are performing well, you know, from a bank's perspective, you, that's not a healthy company. Essentially, you have a company now and you're running, you're running assets through it, and you have a balance sheet. But if you have a deficit, you know, that's that's not uh, that's not advantageous to them to be able to help you. So setting yourself up to not maybe be in that situation is super ideal if you're looking to um, approach a bank. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Second thing a lender is going to take a look at is the strength of the income coming in for that holding company. Um, so again, starting on the residential side because you're qualifying with your personal guarantee and your personal income, it, the strength of the income doesn't matter as much on the residential side. Now, if it comes down to it and a lender is taking a look at a holding company that has deficits versus a holding company that has retained earnings, it's obviously more beneficial to have a holding company that has some retained earnings and there it does look better on paper. But again, on the residential side, you are qualifying personally. So that uh, corporate income in the holding company may not come into effect as much as you would see on the commercial side. Shifting into the commercial side, it's very important. <laughs> you know, the strength of the income on the commercial side can make or break the deal. Kind of like what I was just talking about there. The first step on a commercial deal is you're going to take a look at the building. Is it debt servicing at that 1.2, 1.25? If it is, great. But now they're going to take a look at you know what is the corporate uh, guarantee looking like? Um, what's the corporate covenants? Uh, is there income coming in to that uh, company? How long has it been generating that income for? What's the strength of it? You know, we just touched on these things under the length of time, but basically they want to see some sort of retained earnings and, and net positive cash flow in that company. Um, the last thing they're gonna look at on these commercial deals is your own personal income. Uh, so being able to support um, you know, uh, a very close debt servicing ratio with your corporate income is, is going to be uh, a positive to have. They're gonna take a look at your last three years of history, uh, corporate financials. Um, so just making sure there's positive cash flow in that holding company is going to be a really good uh, step to have to help securitize your commercial purchase. Yeah, and I know we touched on it before, but uh, you know, commercial lending isn't necessarily as black and white as you check these boxes and it works. Um, you know, the strength of a buyer also comes into play when you have a a new company. So do you have the capital required to take care of any uh, expenses that might come up? You know, some of these larger buildings have significant amount of uh, renovations that need to be completed over a certain period of time. So you know, do you have the capacity to be able to deal with any of those up expenses that could come up? It's not just a matter of, you know, if my holding company makes money, that's great, but you know, if, do you, can you actually take care of that building? Um, there's a handful of different things that go into actually qualifying for these loans. Yeah, and, and it's important to understand, like Josh said, it is fluid on the commercial side. So just because you have you know, a deficit in that holding company, there are some things we can do to offset that deficit. You know, the lender is going to take a look at um, how much are you paying in amortization in a year, um, any long-term interest that you may have, um, and any large on, uh, or non-normal or non-regular maintenance type or repair payments that you have. Um, you know, if you spend $30,000, $40,000 on a commercial roof, you're not spending thirty, forty thousand dollars each year. So, if you had a really large expense in you know 2020, and that repair maintenance value was pretty large, depending on what it was, you know we're able to add these back onto that net operating income line. And if it's only in a deficit because there was some larger expenses that year, you know we can actually, I said, take those off. And you know now we're looking at having a bit of a net positive cash flow on there. Um, so, like Josh said, it is super fluid on the commercial side, and there are some things to just note. Um, if you are showing a deficit, you know, let us know why you were showing a deficit. Hey, 
I put a new roof on my building this year, or we had a lot of long-term interest that we were paying out or amortization. Like I said, we can add these things back and play around those numbers and maybe get you back into a positive cash flow situation on that corporation. All right, guys, so everybody knows the advantages of having a holding company or purchasing real estate in a holding company. One being tax benefits. You, know, you can use it to your advantage to be able to either defer taxes on the personal side. Um, potential tax benefits. <laughs> potential tax benefits. Go talk to your accountant about it. <laughs> um, personal liability sheltering is probably the main reason why we see people purchasing residential real estate in a holding company. Um, they would like, most of these people want to purchase these assets in a holding company because eventually they want to go purchase their dream home. And their dream home, they know if they have 10 properties that are rental properties in their personal name, it's going to drastically affect their ability to be able to purchase that home or, um, you know, create that kind of life that they kind of set out for themselves. So, you know, from, from a, like a planning perspective, it makes sense. Uh, but, you know, it's definitely an advantage because it allows you to be able to keep the liability and um, costs separate from your personal debt servicing. Um, so, you know, that's a really great uh, advantage to having a holding company. Um, partnership structuring, it's a lot easier to be able to add a director to the corporation. Um, so if you have a JV partnership, you know, it's a lot cleaner than just having two people on title. If, for example, somebody wanted to get paid out, it'd be easier just to, sh to change the directorship of a corporation than it would be to you know, maybe pay somebody out, depending on how that works, um, qualifying conventionally with a bank. And anonymity. Some people don't like people knowing, uh, don't like their name on title. So they would much rather have a numbered company. It's just kind of one step removed from wherever that may be. Um, many people have many reasons for you know, the anonymity aspect of things, but some people. Internet trolls. <laughs> yeah, internet trolls. So, you know. It's a handful of advantages of opening up a holding corporation. I don't want you guys to think that it's just doom and gloom and we don't want you to do it, but um, you know, there are some advantages of it. Yeah, as with everything in real estate, it is case specific. So making sure, you know, each time you're looking to do a purchase, you touch base with your, your power team and, you know, the people who are responsible for that section and just say, hey, I'm purchasing this, just want to make sure we're going to be good for this, this and this. Make sure it's confirmed and, and then you can go ahead with that purchase. Don't ever assume, you know, just because this deal, everything happened and lined up this way that this next purchase is going to be the exact same way. So just do the due diligence every time you get into that transaction. Um, some of the disadvantages, um, you know, on the residential side, you do limit the amount of lenders that you're going to be able to have access to. Not every lender residentially wants to do properties in a hold co. Um, some may only allow rentals. Uh, some don't allow for personal properties to be purchased. Um, so just understanding that relationship with the residential side and how you're going to be limited. Um, lenders will juice up the premium as well too sometimes. If you're looking to do a, a B-side purchase in a, a holding company, you're probably looking at a you know, 25 to 50 basis points rate hike. So you know, is it even worth it to go and purchase a rental company in a, a, rent, a rental property in a holding company if you're going to have a rate premium and an increased mortgage payment? And when it's all about cash flow, how much does that 25, 50 basis points affect your bottom line and you know, is it worth it? Um, and increase yearly expenses. You know, when you have a operating company or a holding company, you need someone to do the taxes and someone to monitor it. Um, you know, your lawyer fees, your accounting fees on that, it is an added expense depending on how large your taxes are and how much revenue and, and you know, operating expenses you had. You, know, you could be looking at a four to $5,000 tax bill at the end of the year. So just understanding what the additional costs are gonna be through maintaining that uh, corporation, um, you know, and how that's gonna affect your bottom line, all things you need to consider when moving forward. Yeah, last but not least, we want to talk about some of the documents a lender might require when you're purchasing a property through a holding company. First being articles of incorporation. They're going to need to see that the, uh, the actual corporation is owned by yourself or yourself and your partner. Um, they're going to request the directorship. Um, all right, we're going to need the directorship registry, so you're going to need to see who actually owns the property. Um, you could have different share classes depending on obviously who's responsible for what and how that works. Um, three years corporate financials. These corporate financials are going to show the viability of your corporation. Do you run a deficit? Do you have cash flow? Um, your total expenses on uh, the assets that you own in that corporation. Income expense reports is for each individual property. So if you are approaching a new bank that you don't have a relationship with, they are going to want to know how your other assets are performing. Um, and obviously, you know, if you're in a situation that they can lend you money based off of your past performing assets. Um, bylaws, they're going to want to know 
um, if there's any specific uh, bylaws that are associated with your um, with your purchase, you know, can you actually do this? Can you not do this? Um, and personal net worth statements. They're going to want to see you guys have the ability to be able to purchase these assets and you have the capacity to be able to take care of all the assets that you're purchasing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When we talked about the articles of incorporation, the directorship, what the lenders are really looking for is how many people are on the, the articles of this corporation and what percentage of, of share ownership do they hold? If you're purchasing a property and you have three people on, on that corporation, anybody with a 20% shareholder or greater, they're going to want them to actually personally guarantee the mortgage and to be on title. Um, so that's something to remember if, if you're buying that property in a corporation and you have more than one member, figuring out who owns what shares and, and understanding how the lender is going to want uh, to structure the purchase is, is going to be important. Um, if you have someone who only has a 5% shareholdership, you know, they may not be required to actually come on title and personally guarantee the mortgage. And I've seen some deals in the past where um, investing partners have come on who are providing the down payment, didn't actually want to be on title. Um, one thing you could look at is, you know, structuring them with a lower shareholdership. But if that person is coming under the purchase and providing a majority of the down payment, regardless of that share of ownership, the lender is probably going to want them to be on title anyway. So also understanding the lender's needs and reducing their risk and what they're going to want for personal guarantees, um, you know, could affect the purchase as well too, if, if someone doesn't want to personally guarantee that mortgage. So just understanding how that works is important. Awesome guys. So we've essentially covered most of the things we need to know about holding corps or at least the initial tip of the iceberg, let's call it, when it comes to uh, holding corps, because again, there's also the legal aspects, there's the accounting aspects, and then the financing aspects, and then just really knowing what you're trying to accomplish overall as an investor, right? I feel like that's almost always where we start, is like, what's your overall why? What are we actually trying to do here? Now, I know when you're talking to a lot of lawyers, they're often going to push you hard initially to get into a holding corp right away, because they're looking at it through a risk aversion perspective, right? Secondly, they're often cost-oriented, believe it or not, um, not necessarily cost-oriented towards their fees, but cost-oriented towards all the other fees that their clients pay. And so they, they're the ones that see land transfer tax. So oftentimes they're concerned about their clients having to pay land transfer tax twice. But again, obviously your finance team, they're gonna be focused on how can we actually finance this deal and the next deal and all the other deals that you're probably planning on doing. And the accountants are really just gonna be focused on how can I minimize the taxes you're gonna pay, right? How can I set up an effective, efficient tax structure as well as just an efficient approach if and when we go dispose of these assets, what are those tax consequences or liabilities gonna be? So I think it's really important that we take a holistic approach here. And that really starts with knowing what we're trying to accomplish at the beginning when we set out to either set up that holding corp or buy personally. Yeah, main theme for the last year has been what's your goal and, and how do we get everybody to work as a whole? Because like you said, everybody focuses on, on three different points. Mm -hmm. um, so to be able to get them to come together and focus the majority on your goals moving forward is the ideal goal. All right, I really appreciate the guys joining us on today's episode. If you guys want to follow along with them on social media, we'll have links to all their contact information in the video description down below. Reminder, they've also got their own YouTube channel where they're producing their own videos going deeper and just into more of these complex issues that you need to be aware of as a real estate investor. This is really important, but also, they are real life people, so you can actually pick up the phone, get on the phone with Josh or Aaron, and actually just chat through your exact situation because so much of real estate is context oriented, right? A lot of real estate investors are familiar with the old adage, location, 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 but I think when it comes to actually putting the deal together, it's all about like context, context, context. And so you need to get on the phone with your power team and really explain the context of the situation that you're going through right now, as well as the contents of your bigger overall situation, your why, what your big goal is. So appreciate you guys jumping on uh, the channel again and uh, looking forward to the next video. Absolutely. Thanks again for taking the time to watch this video and thanks to Josh and Aaron for taking the time to shoot this video. If you guys got value from this video, smash that like button, hit subscribe if you're new to my channel and make sure you jump over and give a subscribe to Josh and Aaron as well. They've actually started their own YouTube channel where they're producing weekly content for you guys completely free, just trying to help educate you when it comes to financing your real estate transactions. I think it's amazing. We always love supporting other great Canadian content creators. So make sure you jump over, give them a subscribe. It would mean a lot to them and we'll see you in the next video.